Good evening, and welcome to this evening's panel discussion on sound, mysterious sound, impossible sound, creating the impossible mysterious sound, and the effects on love and friendship of rehearsing the creation of the impossible and mysterious sound. I am Ludwig van Beethoven, composer, and to my left is Kazimodo, hunchback, and former bell ringer for Notre Dame de Paris. <laughs> I would like to begin by saying that I am an old man in the last years of my life. My health is failing, my memory is broken, and I am completely deaf. My friend Kazimoto is deaf as well. Nevertheless, we've asked ourselves to head this panel discussion on sound, mysterious sound, impossible sound, etc., because of our recent collaboration towards the creation of that very thing a mysterious, impossible sound. That is not the sound. The details of our collaboration we'll come to in a moment, but first, uh, Kazimoto has a statement he'd like to read. Kazimoto? Thank you. There are two types of failure when it comes to artistic endeavor. The first type of failure is greeted with noise, clamor, a hooting and booing and hissing and raspering. The sonic demons of derision that dwell in the lower inaudible frequencies of our culture's perpetual murmur of scorn rise through the throats of the public and cannon forth blowing and breaking the air with their thunderous dismissal of the artist's small effort. The second type of failure is greeted with silence. Embarrassed and aghast, the universe looks upon the artist's creation and all that is heard is the sound of our wicked planet turning in space. Uh, so, in, uh, so, so what you're saying is in the second sort of failure, no sound is heard. That is correct. No sound. So uh, how would you classify our failure for we did in fact fail in our collaboration uh, there in your small hut at the edge of the marshes Failed. There in the twilight, in the brackish scent beneath the faint stars around the bell table. What, what type of failure was ours? The type met with sound or with silence? Our failure was met with silence. Hmm. Well, uh... That's about all the time we have for this evening. Uh, thank you so much for coming out, and good night. Good evening, and welcome to this evening's panel discussion on sound, mysterious sound, impossible sound, evoking 
the impossible mysterious sound and the effects on love and friendship of rehearsing the evocation of the mysterious and impossible sound. That is not the sound. I am Ludwig von Beethoven, and to my left is Kazimoto, a former bell ringer for something I, I don't uh, remember. Um, as we are both deaf, there will be no questions taken from the audience this evening. Thank you. Uh, now, before we uh, move on to the details of our collaboration, uh, the marshes at twilight, uh, the bell table, and so forth. Kazimoto uh, would like to read a statement. Kazimoto? Thank you. In our effort to create Anton Chekhov's impossible, mysterious sound, I believe everything would have gone a lot better if we had not rehearsed in my house. My house is small and muddy. It stinks of marsh waters. Beethoven has a very nice, large apartment, and he should have let us rehearse there. If I might uh, comment on what you've just said before I forget what you've just said, uh, do I understand that it is your position that we might have avoided our failure in creating this particular sound, had we rehearsed at my place? No. Failure could not have been avoided. But it would have been more pleasant to fail in one of your sunny and well-ventilated rooms with the floors of polished pine. Yes, but, but comfort aside, it's your belief that our collaboration would not have succeeded no matter what the circumstances, yes? Our collaboration was doomed. The world externals had no bearing. Yes. Uh, but uh, now it seems that time has passed us by. There's certainly more to be said, but it never will be. Thank you, and good night. Welcome, everybody. Welcome to our panel discussion on summoning that which perhaps does not exist. The sound Kazimoto and I attempted to bring into being is a sound described in a stage direction at the end of Act Two of Anton Chekhov's The Cherry Orchard. At, the, at this time, I can't remember very well the scene or the stage direction, so we'll have Kazimoto explain it all. In the scene, Renievskaya is sitting out of doors with her family and the other characters of her in the outskirts of her estate. They've sat and talked about death and plants and Russia and giants. But now the conversation has come to a pause. And they sit there in silence. It is here, at this pause, that the stage direction appears. It reads, Lefeka nishma merachok tzli ki ilu yetza mehashamayim kmo meitar shenitak be'etzem hu govea leito. Suddenly, coming as if out of the sky, like the sound of a string snapping, slowly and sadly dying away. <laughs> that 
That is not the sound. But exactly what the sound is, is not clear at all. The characters themselves discuss it. The sound, if nothing else, spurs them from their melancholy silence, but none agree on what it might be. An owl? A heron? Uh, a cable breaking in some distant mine? If it is a string, what kind of string is it? And how could a string sound to anyone like an owl? That is not the sound. It could be anything. Chekhov himself will be no help. In the play's first production, which will be staged long after Kazimoto's and my death, a production directed by Stanislavski himself, a dying Chekhov will complain petulantly that the sound Stanislavski comes up with is totally inadequate. It is such a simple instruction, he will say. What could be more clear? A distant sound coming as if out of the sky like the sound of a string snapping slowly and sadly dying away. That is not the sound. And now, we have to say goodbye. Thank you uh, for coming. As you leave, we ask that you not let what you've seen and heard here tonight seep too quickly from your minds, for our best lives are lived like yours in the memories of others. Welcome to this evening's panel discussion on expressing the inexpressible sound. Uh, tonight we'll be hearing from myself, Ludwig von Beethoven, and my collaborator, Kazimoto. First, an opening statement. Good evening. What is it I want? Above all, I seek a total lack of faith, a pure disbelief, a state of knowing fully that there is nothing above or below the sky, that all is ruin, and beyond ruin, grief, and a vacuum. Good evening. I curse you. Uh, but uh, isn't it precisely faith, a great deal of faith, that is required when tackling the problem of expressing the inexpressible, the unevocable sound? Yes, and I want relief from this impossible problem. I want relief altogether from the urge to create. I want to be left to sit in my hut at my table, surrounded by the sound of crows and frogs, to be left alone, to memorize my many sorrows. Are there any questions at this point? Then let's take a little break. Good evening and welcome. Welcome, welcome, welcome. We welcome you. We are so happy you could all make it out this evening to hear us discuss our project on Impossible Sound.
That is not the sound. Do you have a statement you'd like to read? We know not, and no search will make us know. Only the event will teach us in its hour. That is not the sound. To recap, always in twilight, I would leave my apartments and cross the marshes to my friend Kazimoto's small hut, always in twilight, to rehearse, to work on our project, the project concerning Chekhov's stage direction. A distant sound is heard coming out of the sky, crossing the marshes in twilight, the stars emerging from their distant, invisible nowhere, my, my pessimism would leave me, and, and my mind would quiver with inspiration. On every twilight in which he crossed the marshes to my hut, I could hear Ludwig von Beethoven footfalls from far away flopping and slurping in the muck. Nearer and nearer, so determinated, so sure. Slock, slock, slock. So certain that our collaboration could be nothing but a success. It was, to me, a dread sound. The sound of a fool bringing defeat into my sad life once again. We could never satisfy the stage direction from Chekhov's cherry orchard. I would walk through his door with an eagerness. He will come through my rough door, his silk slippers soaked in the box infections and his creamy stockings streaked black by soggy reeds. The sound of his spongy tread on my planks, his drippings on my rug. The great man. We would sit at his bell table, a, a table made uh, actually out of a bell, a bell stolen by Kazimoto, uh, from the towers of Notre Dame when he left that uh, tragic cathedral for good in 1482. It was not a very good table, as nowhere was it flat. Just, just an enormous bell sitting on the floor with chairs surrounding it. I mean, if you put your drink or your sandwich on it, they would just slide onto the rug. We would sit at the bell table. The starry night gone black, the crow asleep, its dreamless brain as dark as its wing. To rehearse, to bring into being one sound. And from there is remembered nothing more. We now fade from you as you from us. Marsh, bell table, crow, and door. Good evening. Uh, have all of you arrived? Uh, can everyone see us? <laughs> can everyone hear me? Yes. Is this thing on? Yes. 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 Okay. Great. Uh, did you find the building all right? Okay. Did you find the room? You made it downstairs. Yes. Excellent. Uh, did you find your seat? Yes. Are you seated comfortably? Yes. Yes. 
Uh, were you given a program? Yes? Uh, is your program legible? Is it, is your program informative? Is it attractively laid out? Are you warm enough? Not too cool? No, ah, it's a little cold. We can adjust that, it's a little cool in the room. Uh, are you attentive? Obviously. Are, are you nearly silent? Yes. Are you thinking grand thoughts? Please. Count thy gains. Would thou be born for this? At the bell table, the starry night gone black. The crow above, the frogs below. We would rehearse. From the corners of my hut, I would bring all manners of instruments and objects to strum, to strike, to blow, to pluck, all in the service of Dr. Anton Chekhov and his diabolical instruction. In these re hundreds of rehearsals, Ludwig von Beethoven offered only one single sound as the possible solution to Chekhov's vague instruction. The sound of the pages of Emily Dickinson's collected poems being fanned with his thumb. At the time of our rehearsals in the year 1825, Emily Dickinson had not wrote any poetry. Emily Dickinson had not been born. Is this not the most perverse sentimentality? To delicately flatter the poems of a not born lonely recluse? And furthermore, to amplify this fluttering? Good night. Good night. I curse you! Hello, and welcome to our panel discussion on the pleasures associated with the making of an impossible thing. I am Ludwig van Beethoven. Our project concerned the infamous stage direction in Anton Chekhov's last play, The Cherry Orchard, uh, a play which he wrote, by the way, when he was dying of consumption, coughing his lungs out over the pages. The stage direction, which reads, suddenly a distant sound is heard, coming as if out of the sky, like the sound of a string snapping slowly and sadly dying away. The true sadness of this sound, of course, is that it has not yet been born. Uh, that is not the sound. Uh, Kazimoto has some questions to get us started. Thank you. My questions are simple questions. <clears throat> Where is the place for the uncreated in this modern world? Where do we put the happiness that has not yet been forged? Where do we store the love that has not yet been sculpted? Where is the room for keeping all these nothings? The room 
for keeping all these nothings. I would like to think such a room exists. I don't believe in this room. <laughs> Maybe you're right. After all, who would go through the trouble of building it? Let us never speak of it again. It's a waste of time. No. Let us rather say that it is a mystery only to be investigated with silence. Thank you for coming. <clears throat> Good evening, and uh, welcome to our panel discussion on what currently is not, and perhaps never will be, but is worth talking about nonetheless, as it. The non-existent can never speak for itself, and because the non-existent suffers necessarily in silence, it is therefore a compassionate impulse to speak of it, to speak for the non-existence. The same compassionate impulse which guides the conversational plays of Anton Chekhov. The same impulse which motivates my friend Kazimoto to give an opening statement. Kazimoto. Thank you. In our effort to create Anton Chekhov's impossible, mysterious sound, I believe everything would have gone a lot better if we had not rehearsed in my house. Uh, but um, it, 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 uh, <laughs> it was the walk uh, to your house, which was for me essential. Always in twilight, always by way of the marshes, the stars being born once again above my head, the frogs, the crows. I found it was only this somewhat eerie, wild and wondrous landscape which could prepare me for our project. Uh, only this walk which would fill me with the enthusiasm necessary for the pursuit of an impossibility. But your enthusiasm was no help at all. You sat in rehearsals and never had a single good idea. Is that true? I don't think you even finished reading The Cherry Orchard. Yes. I've never read that. The Cherry Orchard. The Cherry Orchard. Would that have helped, you think? Should I have read The Cherry Orchard? Yes. No. Our failure was certain. Should I have read The Cherry Orchard? Yes, sir. Yes. The end has come. Welcome. Welcome to this evening's panel discussion on, uh, on, uh, what is it? Uh, the sound of mud? Moss? The, the pale stars? Kazimoto has a statement. Lefeta nishmat slil mirachok. Kilu yotze me ashamay. Kmo meita shenitak. Beetzem ugover leito. Is that it? That's not it. 
at the bell table. The starry night gone black. The crow asleep. It's dreamless brain dark as its wing. statements. I thought my life as it was described by Victor Hugo was terrible. A wounded scream separated from my beloved cathedral. My Esmeralda's body tossed into a pit of skeletons but to rehearse with you, Ludovic, that was pure horror. <laughs> to wait in my hut each twilight and hear your approach across the marshes, to have you come through my door stuffed with your eager genius, your shoes filled with the minnows and mud, your brain spitting sparks, only to have you sit at my table each night and contribute nothing to an impossible sound. Above all I seek is a total lack of faith, a pure disbelief, a state of knowing that there is nothing above or beneath the sky. But still as it is, I still arrive less than a ghost to sit before the microphone again, to try again to find a thing less real than my son. Uh, good evening uh, to every one of you and welcome to tonight's panel discussion. Welcome. Make yourselves comfortable. Relax. Close your eyes. Now, imagine, imagine yourself to be not at this panel discussion regarding impossible mysterious sound, but in a glittering Viennese concert hall for the debut of uh, my Mass in C, or my fifth piano concerto, or my ninth symphony. The conductor raises the baton. The ladies' gowns rustle in anticipation. I am Ludwig van Beethoven. All this was created by me, you would think, if, if you were myself. All of it. The music, of course, but the baton, the conductor, the ladies, the gowns, all of it has come into this place because of my efforts in life. You would think, if, if you were me, 
and that which I have created will endure until the end. Throughout every second of recorded time, not for one moment will it be forgotten. You would think. Now, open your eyes. Welcome to this evening's panel discussion on what I have failed to make, which will endure as well, and in its terrifying absence exist beyond the close of eternity, Kazimoto. Oh, my darling, my precious, my beautiful orchard, my life, my youth, my happiness, goodbye, goodbye. In uh, Anton Chekhov's The Cherry Orchard, a uh, play which I have yet to read, uh, a stage direction appears twice, uh, once at the end of Act Two and again at the close of the play. It reads, a distant sound is heard, coming as if out of the sky, like the sound of a string snapping slowly, sadly, dying away. In all the worlds, actual and theatrical, there is no such sound. At the bell table, the crow above, the frog below, the black night beyond the door, we know not, and no search can make us know. Only the event will teach us in its hour. Oh, my darling, my precious, my beautiful orchard, My life, my youth, my happiness, goodbye. 